Welcome to the 150th annual meeting of Charleston Animal Society. So when we, we think of uh, the 150 years of Charleston Animal <laughs> Society, of course, the first thing that comes to mind for us is, is Gumby and dogs like Gumby. Gumby the Hound was Charleston Animal Society's favorite escape artist. He was adopted 11 times, and each time he would escape and find his way back to Charleston Animal Society. He uh, would often jump fences that were up to six feet high, or he would, um, I think at one point, he found himself inside someone's house at 3 a.m. and was standing on their coffee table and he barked at them and then I think jumped out a screen window on the first floor. And um, I think, yeah, I think at one point he ended up inside someone's boat. Um, <laughs> I actually, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, I think. It finally dawned on everybody the reason Gumby was escaping. He loved Charleston Animal Society and one person in particular, John Martin, who worked on the behavior team. The decision was made to just kind of make him a permanent resident because it was just it was very difficult to find a home that was that was appropriate for him. He uh, he became a greeter dog for playgroup, so he would help introduce other dogs that were that were less socialized, and he would kind of help them kind of figure out how to be a dog. Gumby was a legend for another reason. He became the first dog at the shelter to ever donate blood serum to help kittens suffering from an eye condition that could cause blindness. John and his wife Joanna adopted Gumby and moved to New York City, where Gumby's unique look stopped people in their tracks. He even had his own followers on Instagram. He was he was an instant hit. He raised awareness for adoption. People would ask, "Where did you find him?" And his impact on 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 everybody he met, on animals, on people, on on us. Because I think we couldn't be more grateful for anything that ever happened. Sadly, Gumby said goodbye last year, but his impact lives on. He's he's still he's still with us in our hearts every day, and we we still talk about him every day as if he were still here. And because I think in a lot of ways he still is. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society board members and sesquicentennial committee chairs Jane Graham and Patricia Henley. Hey, Patricia. Hi, Jane. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the 150th annual meeting of the Charleston Animal Society. This is a momentous occasion to celebrate a century and a half, century and a half of caring and compassion and love toward animals. Gumby's story, which hopefully you all found some Kleenex if you didn't bring it your, uh, in your own pocket, exemplifies this legacy of care. When people say it's just a dog or it's just a cat, we say this animal is a family member that brings us more joy than we deserve. In 1874, when working animals like horses and cattle were needlessly subjected to suffering, we said these animals deserve better and the South Carolina Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was born. And in 1900, one of the organization's founders gave his entire life's fortune to the animals in his will. And it was not Hank Greer, although <laughs> he's, he's following closely in those footsteps, I will say. The, the organization eventually changed its name to the John Ancrum SPCA in his honor. Through World War II, we had a visionary woman at the helm. Margaret Waring led us to build our very first animal shelter on Meeting Street in 1947. We would move to West Ashley, then to North Charleston, and in 2008, we moved to the current campus on Remount Road and changed our name to the Charleston Animal Society. Long history with different names and different locations, but we've always had the same focus on our mission, the prevention of cruelty to animals. We welcome each and every one of you here tonight to share in our history and in our legacy of care because we always say that you, 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 and you, and you are the Charleston Animal Society. Thank you very much.
founded by a distinguished group of Charlestonians on March 14, 1874 as the South Carolina Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, with Nathaniel Russell Middleton serving as its first president, the organization's immediate concerns were to combat the neglect of working animals, the inhumane shipping of cattle, and to resolve the epidemic of stray dogs. As the needs of the community changed, so did the organization expanding into teaching compassion to children and, in 1948, sheltering animals in response to the horrific conditions and mass killings by local government as a way of responding to stray dogs. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society Board Chair, Laurel Greer. Welcome and thank you all so very much for being here this evening. We truly appreciate this attendance, which is overwhelming. Thank you so much. Charleston Animal Society is not only 150 years old, we are 150 years strong. As we reflect on 2023, a year filled with challenges for animal shelters across the country and our state, Charleston Animal Society stands committed more than ever to the animals in our community. Despite the odds, we continue our mission to pave the way for a no-kill state, one of the few across the country and certainly the first in the Deep South. Internationally recognized as a model for life-saving success, Charleston Animal Society operates 24-7, saving and caring for nearly 20,000 animals a year. Two major milestones from last year include setting a Guinness World Record for pet vaccines with the support of over 30 veterinarians. It was an amazing sight, if any of you were there. And organizing the largest annual statewide adoption event for dogs and cats for the sixth consecutive year. Our focus remains on making a lasting impact in our community by ending three tragedies, unnecessary euthanasia, animal overpopulation, and animal cruelty. We ended the year on several high notes. We had 12 consecutive years of exemplary audits by independent auditing firms. We had 12 years of South Carolina's top-rated nonprofit, and 11 consecutive years of building and sustaining the Southeast's first no-kill county. It is mind-boggling to think of how far we have come in 150 years. At the turn of the century, we were pleading with local gov government to stop drowning dogs in the Cooper River as a means of euthanasia. In 2013, we led Charleston to become the first no-kill community in the Southeast. As Jane and Patricia mentioned, our first shelter wasn't built until 74 years after we had formed. Today, our dedication to animals goes beyond the physical walls of a shelter to include a mobile spay-neuter clinic that travels the state a sanctuary that offers acres of freedom for free-roaming cats, emergency transports that save animals caught in the eye of hurricanes and victimized in horrific puppy mills, and guidance and assistance to organizations across the state through our No-Kill South Carolina initiative. Since 1874, we have come very far. We have so much further to go. So many more animals need our life-saving care. None of this would have been possible without the people in this room and those of you watching on Facebook. The support of our 20,000 members fuels our mission and drives us forward. As we move through 2024, we thank you for your love and dedication to the animals, and we look forward to achieving even greater success together. Thank you all. We're honored to be here. We're honored to be part of their mission in accomplishing uh, the safety and the, the well-being of animals. And the Defender 130 will get that job done with its capability. So this vehicle is actually going to help us reach animals across South Carolina and the Southeast that need help the most. Whether that's going to be from a large-scale cruelty case, um, behind some kind of rough terrain, or animals impacted by natural disasters like flooding or hurricanes. 
Thanks to the entire Land Rover family, um, both you know here locally, West Ashley, as well as um, across the entire country and overseas. Um, as President Land Rover said, I think he said there was over half a million votes in this nationwide contest, and I just want to thank all of our supporters, everyone that voted for Charleston Animal Society um, to help us get this vehicle. We truly are the defenders of animals. Thank you, Land Rover, for this opportunity to go above and beyond for animals as we stand ready for anything that threatens their lives. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society board member, Brantley Meyer. Thank you. Land Rover believes that nonprofits are the unsung heroes of our communities. For decades, Land Rovers have taken service workers on missions to help others. In 2021, Land Rover launched the Defender Service Awards to recognize the most outstanding nonprofits in the United States and Canada. In 2023, Charleston Animal Society won the Honorees Division, going up against some of the best nonprofits from across the U.S. and Canada. You can see the vehicle just outside the hotel. But this Defender will allow us to reach animals caught in the most difficult of places, in cruelty cases with mountainous terrains, in floods caused by storms and hurricanes, Time and again, national organizations and those across the state call on us to help animals, especially when no one else will respond. So this Defender will allow us to continue this life-saving work. So today we are honored to have Customer Service Market Manager at Jaguar Land Rover North America, Brad Beer, with us. Brad, Charleston has a reputation for road war as world warriors, and now this amazing gift uh, from the Defender Service Awards will allow us to travel wherever animals need our life-saving assistance. So on behalf of Charles Animal Society, we thank you. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the team behind the Defender Service Awards, I would like to share the sincere appreciation for being recognized by the Charleston Animal Society. Nonprofit organizations are vital in making a difference where it matters most in their local communities. Inspired by the limitless acts of selflessness throughout the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021, the Defender Service Awards were launched to honor and recognize everyday heroes striving to do good for their neighbors. To date, 18 Defenders and $700,000 in monetary awards have been provided to nonprofits across the U.S. and Canada who genuinely make a difference. We couldn't be prouder to have Charleston Animal Society represent the Defender Service Awards. The legacy behind this organization is truly remarkable. As pet lovers, we recognize this organization's important role and urgency in the Charleston community. Your love and care and dedication to all your rescues is heartwarming and inspiring. Thank you again for the recognition. We are humbled to know that your new Defender will aid in your mission to serve the well-being of the animals of the Charleston community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elise Scoff. Um, I'm a third year for the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe DiBenedetto. I'm an internal medicine specialist here in Philadelphia. Hey, I'm Cole Davis. I'm a third year vet student at the University of Georgia. To think that I'm already this hands-on is incredible. I never thought that I would even have this experience in vet school, um, much less four weeks into rotations. During my first, I would say, I think it was my second rotation on it, at Cornell, I ended up coming to Charleston Animal Society and did an internship here, really specializing in not just surgical experience, but also population management. Um, I expected just to do spays and neuters, but I learned a whole lot more. I learned how to break down problems, um, learned really how to treat a multitude of diseases, things I wasn't familiar with. It's a great experience. It's my second rotation out, and I've been able to come here. I think we got about 50 surgeries in last week, and I'm pushing somewhere around 32 this week. The doctors are all super helpful. They're able to walk us through at the start and help coach us if we ever have any problems. The vets here are natural born teachers. Um, they're here for you. It's not a scary environment to learn at all. Everyone at Charleston Animal Society was fantastic. They, they really helped not only learn surgical experience, but really answer all of my questions whenever I had them. They're a fun group to work with. Our learning is amazing here. I don't think I could have gotten this anywhere else.
please welcome Charleston Animal Society board member and News 2 anchor Carolyn Murray. The budding veterinarians and the veterinarians who are already caring for our animals are the future of health care and welfare of animals. And you just saw amazing examples of them in that video. Now, you may not realize this, but there is a veterinarian shortage across South Carolina and actually across the United States. It is a crisis. Many shelters right here in South Carolina don't even have a veterinarian. The impacts are many. And I'm a journalist, so sometimes I know things, but I did not know this fact. Animals cannot be spayed or neutered if they are not in South Carolina. Well, they can't be adopted under our state regulations. The result of that is that many more animals stay in shelters longer than they should. So those veterinary students who you just saw on the video, they are being educated out of South Carolina, but they still come right here to our own Charleston Animal Society for internships, where they learn the skills of spay and neuter it, as spay and neuter in our actual clinics. Now, it is not often that this Gamecock standing before you is thrilled <laughs> to talk about Clemson University, but I am tonight. Clemson University will be opening the first veterinary college in the state of South Carolina. in just a couple of years. Don't applaud like that for Clemson in November, please. <laughs> Friends, it is my great honor to introduce tonight's featured speaker, the founding dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Clemson University, Dr. Stephen Marks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's uh, absolutely uh, an honor to be here tonight uh, to join you in this momentous celebration. So I'd really just like to give you an update on where we are with the College of Veterinary Medicine, and obviously it's the first college of veterinary medicine in South Carolina. I think it's important to recognize that this is, uh, it's momentous for Clemson, but it's momentous for the state of South Carolina. And my hope is, my vision is that this college will unite South Carolina, will recruit students from throughout the state, and we will work together to improve the lives of people and animals and, and, and really emphasize the human-animal bond within South Carolina. So you've already heard that there's a significant nationwide shortage of veterinarians. South Carolina is, is at great risk. Uh, animals are at risk because we don't have enough veterinarians. So that will really be our role, is to produce veterinarians. Uh, the majority of our students will be South Carolinians. We will accept some out-of-state students, but the goal is to produce boots on the ground, day one prepared veterinarians that will come from South Carolina, that will m remain in South Carolina, and also hopefully uh, go back to some of the un underserved regions within South Carolina. So Clemson already has a strategic plan. Uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine will align their goals or our goals with the, with the, the strategic plan that's referred to as Elevate. And there's, there's a couple of pillars here I'd like you to notice. The, the top priority is to produce a great student and have them have a great student experience at Clemson. So we want them to come to Clemson. We want them to love Clemson. We want them to leave Clemson but feel like they can always come back. Um, also, there's a goal of improving animal-based research. We're hoping to double our uh, research abilities uh, by 2035. And we really, again, there's a human-animal bond involved in here. We really want to improve not just animal lives but human lives within the state. And we're going to build on the Clemson brand, which, as you know, whether you love us or you don't love us, it's a brand. And it stands for quality, and it stands for quality education. So I will throw a couple of animal pictures in here because we are, you know, we are animal lovers. So this is actually my son's cat, Max. Uh, Max is a true hero. So Max, I spent the last 18 years at NC State's College of Veterinary Medicine, and I ran their teaching hospital. 
Max is a blood donor. So Max stayed with us for about two years, and he saved lives. Like, he is a true lifesaver. He donated blood whenever there's an emergency need for transfusions. And then what we do with those cats is after they serve their role as heroes in our hospital, we find them homes. So he found his home with a single, and he interested young women, <laughs> pro soccer player, <laughs> lonely pro soccer player in Charlotte. <laughs> so I emphasize, and by the way, he's got a really nice cat. Um, <laughs> So about our curriculum, we're, we're really, anybody in this audience that is a professional that has some training will, will recognize that it's impossible to know. There's so much knowledge out there, you can't know everything. And veterinary medicine has been known for teaching facts, just like human medicine does. And really, we're going to kind of spin that a different way, and we're really going to try and focus on teaching our, our students how to think. So they're presented with a problem. They need to know how to problem solve. The knowledge is out there. You don't have to have it at the tip of your fingers all the time. We're also going to emphasize professional skills. And I've talked to a couple of you before, before this meeting. Uh, communication is key in veterinary medicine. We still have a cadre of students that come and tell me, well, I was going to go into medical school, but I hate people, so I'm going to be a veterinarian. <laughs> um, that really does not work. Uh, you look at the colleagues, there's several veterinarians in the audience here tonight. We spend a lot of time with people. Every animal that we see, every animal that we touch has a family attached to it. So uh, communication skills are huge. Obviously, we'll teach clinical skills because they have to be doctors. They have to be able to problem solve. They have to be able to put together diagnostic plans, therapeutic plans. But again, we're going to really train them in the Clemson way, which is uh, core values, they have to be smart, they have to be nice, they have to be good citizens. Most of all, they have to become servant leaders in the communities that they return to, hopefully the majority of them in South Carolina. Um, I just tell you that the, the novel thing about Clemson's training program is most veterinary schools have a teaching hospital, and we will not. We will be using what's referred to as a distributed or a distributive model. And that means for most of our small animal training, we will send our students to other hospitals throughout the state of South Carolina and, and rescue groups and humane societies and animal societies so they get to work side by side with the veterinarians that they are most likely to be. So this is really a throwback. It's a really a throwback to an apprentice system. So I'm a specialist in small animal internal medicine. When I train students, the majority of the students don't want to be me. They want to be a general practitioner. They want to work out in the community, not at a university. So this is going to allow us to, to form partnerships with the veterinarians throughout South Carolina. And the students will get to work with people that will be their role models. So I think that's a really important thing to recognize. So we'll have some specialty hospitals. There's specialty hospitals throughout the state. Our students have to be exposed to specialists. But the majority of our students statistically will become general practitioners. And that's who they'll get to work with. So again, this is why I think this will be unifying in the state of South Carolina. It's not just about Clemson. If you look at our logo, you'll notice there's the paw, because there has to be the paw, right? I have more paws in my life now than I've ever had. Um, <laughs> But it also has the palmetto tree. So this is unifying. This is a state university. It's a state-supported university. It's Clemson, but it's also the College of Veterinary Medicine for South Carolina. Uh, we will integrate our curriculum. It'll be a three-year preclinical training program that will be integrated with their clinical training in the fourth year. Our projected class size, that's a big question, will be 80. Okay, our first class will be 80. That will occur in 2026. That means our first class will graduate with their DVM. The first DVM is awarded in the state of South Carolina in 2030. Uh, we are currently building to be a little bit future-proof. We're, um, we're hoping to build out to about 128 students, just in case we have to grow. Um, the faculty will be professionally diverse. And what I mean by that, there'll be general practitioners and specialists in a mix. We hope to attract the top faculty and staff around the country to come to Clemson. All important assets that we will have to train our students. More puppy pictures. So this is my dog. I don't take credit for that. There's somebody else at home that does. His name is Tucker. We sometimes call him different names that rhyme with Tucker. <laughs> I'll leave that up to your imagination. Um, what's interesting about Tucker is Tucker likes to eat socks. So we can talk later about how much it costs to remove a Harry Potter sock from your small intestine. So Tucker is four years old. Tucker has had four surgeries. His owners are not that bright. 
So I'm going to just flip through a couple of these slides. I, I will say those two smiling individuals, one is a former resident at NC State and one is a former student at NC State. This is how you know you're in trouble when you're the hospital director and the people that work with you send you pictures of your dog post-operatively. <laughs> Um, I think the other thing to recognize is that we have amazing facilities at Clemson. So this is a picture of uh, LeMaster Dairy, which is the Clemson University dairy farm. Um, if you don't know Jersey cows, this is like having a herd of golden retrievers. They're very nice, they're very cute, they like to be petted, but they're production animals. So if I show you where the campus is, some of you may be more familiar with Clemson than I am because we've only been there about seven months. But our campus is going to be slightly off campus, and if you know where the Garrison Arena is, it's going to be right down the road from that. It's going to be a spectacular site because we'll get to utilize the, the already present equine center. We're going to get to utilize the LaMaster Dairy, which is now a robotic milking parlor, which is quite fascinating if you have a chance to visit. Uh, we will be able to utilize Simpson Farm, which is a beef and sheep farm. We'll be able to use Morgan uh, Poultry Farm. So we have amazing facilities that are already there, and the veterinary school is just going to unite those areas, utilize those animals so we don't have to reproduce what's already there. Uh, the, the buildings themselves should be quite spectacular. This is, these are the uh, architectural renderings, and you can see that this is a building uh, that's going to be an equine teaching center. That is on the front pasture of the present uh, equine center. And then students will be taught surgery and anatomy in laboratories in this building. This building is going to have a library, classrooms, and offices. We will have a research center for faculty that are engaged in clinical research. And then the only semblance we'll have to a hospital will be a large animal ambulatory truck-based hospital. So we will have students that will be deployed with veterinarians into the community to take care of cattle, horses, and poultry primarily. So those are our goals. And again, what you can see here is the architects have designed this to fit into the Clemson Experimental Forest. So students should come, because veterinary medicine is a stressful training program, they should be able to come into our environment and feel like they're training and they're going to class in a forest, and that's the goal. Timeline here is pretty quick. Uh, 2026 is when we should be our, accepting our first students. 2029, our first students will go into clinical rotations. In 2030, they will be receiving their DVM degree, 80 students. We have a very small group of faculty right now, so if you have interest in coming to work with us at Clemson, let me know. So we're slowly growing that team. And then again, just to highlight our logo here, this is a Clemson logo that is easily recognizable. The Venery School logo, the paw, and the palmetto tree stands for the unification that this college can provide to South Carolina. And really, this is huge because, as you've learned of tonight, the problems with uh, animal cruelty, uh, unowned animals, uh, overpopulation, these are huge problems that the veterinary community can help solve. They can't solve them on their own, but they can help be a part of the team. So we have already developed our curriculum. If you read in the paper, you'll see that our curriculum and our DVM program was approved by the Board of Trustees last week. Uh, we have a couple more hurdles, specifically accreditation by the American Veterinary Medical Association, all things that are a little bit out of our control at this point, but we're moving forward. One of the attractions that we think will draw students to Clemson is we, our goal is to, to attain scholarships for every student in the first year class. So there's 80 seats there. Yeah. So these are scholarships that have already been attained. Each of those orange seats is $100,000. So there are, there are people in South Carolina that love animals, and they are very supportive of our mission and our initiative to have the best veterinary school in North America. So all, all good things. Um, and then if anybody knows Dabo, I'm working hard to get a picture of him with a cow. This is as close as I could get. So it is, uh, again, this is a wonderful evening uh, recognizing unsung heroes for people that protect the unprotected. So thank you for allowing me to speak with you for a couple minutes. I do, I do try and end every talk with Go Tigers, <laughs> specifically tonight. We certainly appreciate Thank your you. encouragement, your comments, your dedication. Thank you so much. Thank we you. We wish you the very best. Yep. It's for the drive home. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Thanks very much.
not a requirement to be crazy, but it helps. <laughs> In our ecosystem, everything is interconnected with each other, and one thing depends on another thing. And when we start saying that it's simply a, a raccoon, or it's simply a squirrel, or it's a baby mouse that needs help, and that it's not anything important, then that tells you where we feel about each other, because we start losing that compassion. The tree that you see behind us is what we call the tree of hope. Uh, some of our babies have been raised in that tree. Keeper of the Wild covers nine counties. Uh, we cover wherever there's a, a need. People call us and we try and get them help. The statues are here to remind us what our mission is, and that's to take care of these little guys. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society board member, Aussie Gear. Good evening, friends, members, and guests. I have the honor of introducing the namesake of Charleston Animal Society's highest award, the Elizabeth Bradham Humanitarian Award. This award is given to those individuals whose accomplishments in alleviating the suffering of animals create significant and lifelong impact in our local community and far beyond. It is named after former board chair Elizabeth Bradham, who led the Animal Society's efforts in building the first no-kill community in the entire Southeast in 2013. <laughs> also would like to recognize a former recipient of the award who's here with us tonight, Mr. Jim Elliott um, of the Avian <laughs> Conservation Center, which is also known affectionately by probably most of us as the Birds of Prey. So thank you, Jim. Now, now it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Bradham, who will present the award to Janet Kinzer, founder and director of Keeper of the Wild, Wildlife Sanctuary and Rescue. So as many of you know, we've all had the, shall we say, the opportunity where we've come across a little creature in our yard or in the country and we haven't known what to do. So Janet has been on the receiving end of several of my phone calls. What do I do? What do I do? I've got a baby possum. I've got a baby squirrel. I've got a baby, baby raccoon. And she's always walked me through the process and always taken care of whatever little baby I had and taking care of me. And given the exploding population of our area, as we have many more much more contact between humans and animals, your service is more important than ever. So I want to thank you for what you've done and you've created, as do all of us here. And just tell us how you got started. Well, <laughs> I was an interior designer and uh, our volunteers say I traded in my high heels for snake boots. Uh, nowadays, the fastest thing I uh, chase is a box turtle. So I have a lot of wonderful team members who, who will go out and does our, will do our rescues. This award is amazing, and I appreciate it so much. But this award is, is far beyond me. It covers all of the precious rehabilitators in the state that tirelessly gets up in the middle of the night, that takes care of a baby, that goes out on a rescue call, who gets in the mud and pulls those babies out and gets them warm back up. We have done a lot of babies through the years. And the way it got started was uh, I was doing a project and somebody was cutting a tree down and 
cut, uh, there was some baby squirrels in it, and it started from there. We also had a tiny baby raccoon that came in, and her name was Annie. And all of my volunteers knows the story about Annie, but she had a heart defect, and she was, uh, she traveled everywhere I went. She went on my rescue calls with me, and one day she started going downhill. Well, back during that time, there were no vets that would take care of a little raccoon because it was a rabies vector animal. So I sat in the parking lot after going uh, to different vet clinics, and nobody would help me with little Annie. So I sat in the uh, parking lot of Pet Vet, and little Annie died. And I cried, and I said, Lord, I can't do it. You're going to have to get somebody else to do your work because this hurts too bad. And the sweetest, gentlest voice said, what about all the other little Annies? You can make it better for the rest, or you can let the ministry die with the one. So with my husband's help, he's been right by my side to encourage me, to keep me going from out of, uh, re re rehabilitating out of my home and now to our, our current location. But we never, every time I look into the face of a baby and I'm feeding that baby or I'm nursing that baby or it's been hit by a car or whatever, I know why I do what I do. And so do all of my volunteers. You'll never meet, well, I guess you will with Charleston Animal Society, but our team is the dearest and the most precious of taking care of these little guys. And many times the only thanks we get is seeing that baby go back to the wild and knowing we've done our job. So, Janet, we would like to present you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Charleston, the Tri-County, and South Carolina is one of the fastest growing areas in the country. More growth means more people, and more people means more animals. Public health and safety infrastructure is stressed, and that means animal shelters as well. Before this growth, animal shelters were already overcrowded. Now we've reached a critical point. There simply isn't enough room for the number of animals coming into shelters. This is resulting in more euthanasia of animals, especially large dogs, not just here in South Carolina, but across the country. Hear all the barking? These are dogs that were brought to us because families moved to Charleston and they ran into housing restrictions that wouldn't take large breeds. Charleston Animal Society does everything we can to help shelters throughout the state of South Carolina, but there's just so much one animal shelter can do. Across the state, county by county, too many local governments are not adequately funding animal sheltering and animal response. This means that our animal control officers are not getting the training they deserve. And at least one old school dog catcher or dog pound kind of mentality where animals are euthanized instead of being saved. So one of the main crises facing shelters in South Carolina is the veterinary shortage. So eight in 10 shelters in the state don't employ a veterinarian. Not only are these shelters unable to access care for their shelter animals, the spay neuter, that they need or the medical care for the animals in their shelter. They're also unable to offer services to the members of the public and their pets. So it's, it's a major crisis. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society President and CEO, Joe Elmore. Holy cow. Um, no pun intended, Dr. Marks. Uh, I never thought that we would welcome so much orange up on the stage of Charleston Animal Society, especially since it's a policy not to wear orange uh, in the facility. But thank you so much. Um, from 
coming down from NC State and uh, heading up our state's first veterinary school. And I love that unification spirit um, all but one day of the year. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, am, I am so blessed. I um, probably get so emotional up here because I'm so proud of each and every one of you. Um, I'm blessed just to be um, in the presence of Jim Elliott and Janet Kenzer, true humanitarians, um, our staff, most incredible staff in the country. Um, our volunteers, all 2,500 of them, uh, you know, I, I love to say this, I love to say that we have 26 volunteers for every employee. Um, just amazing. Um, in our community, um, all of you and everything, but thanks to the staff and volunteers for putting together this 150th annual meeting and Dan Crossy who produces each one of these along with his wing woman, um, Christina Guillermo and the crew uh, for producing yet another wonderful event for our membership and guest. Each and every one of you and all of you together are Charleston Animal Society. As we heard earlier from Laurel Greer, our board chair, this organization has made significant achievements in its 150 year history, along with remarkable accomplishments just last year. However, last year at our annual meeting, I addressed five ongoing issues that threaten our community and state's public health and safety infrastructure. And a threat, <clears throat> it's just like a threat to the environment, that's a threat to us. The threats related to animals are a threat to us. I address the minimal investment in overpopulation prevention, the inadequate sheltering facilities and best practices, the overwhelming supply of pit bull types of dogs and not enough demand to keep up with that, the unorganized and untrained system of animal control in our state, and the ineffective and insufficient public policy that permeates most communities, if not every community throughout South Carolina. These issues continue to threaten our community and state and leave us years, probably decades behind, lagging behind successful communities and states um, in some parts of the country. I also addressed 10 proven leading practices that have largely solved these problems in those successful communities and states. Last month, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the nation's authority on state animal protection laws, released its annual rankings. Our state of South Carolina was number 47. Um, it is, it's embarrassing, it's a shame, because we're behind real impoverished states who have better animal protection laws, such as Mississippi and Arkansas. We must demand change from our local elected officials and our state officials and hold them accountable. We just heard from our key leadership in the video about the challenges facing us at this critical time in our history. Friends, the chickens have come home to roost and those chickens are creating a mess, a real mess. Vice President and COO Alton Roman warned of the overwhelming pressure of our accelerating human population in the Tri-County and what that is doing to all of the animal shelters in the Tri-County area. Our Chief Life-Saving Officer Pearl Sutton warned us about the growing number of dogs restricted in housing and brought to the Animal Society. Chief Veterinary Officer Elizabeth Fuller, Lucy Fuller, warned of the disproportionate impact of the national veterinary shortage crisis on animal shelters and affordable spay neuter because that's very important too. With only 80% or 80% of our shelters across our state not even having a veterinarian on staff, yet dealing with hundreds, sometimes thousands of animals. Our chief project officer, Abigail Appleton, warned of the dog catcher, dog pound mentality that's permeated several governments, including some of our local governments, exacerbating rather than mitigating this crisis. In 2008, when the Animal Society moved to its new location on Remount Road in North Charleston, it was over capacity on day one, having to resign itself to continue to euthanize animals because of a lack of space. And it has been over capacity for 16 years. However, with aggressive investments in spay and neuter and the implementation of leading practices, proven practices, your animal society managed to reduce the population of animals 
bringing down that, ten, bringing down that trend over a 10-year period and prevent our community from having to build additional several animal shelters adequate for our community, saving tens of millions of taxpayer and philanthropy dollars, culminating with building the first no-kill county in the entire Southeast in 2013. Despite continuing challenges that have created a local, state, and national animal crisis, your Charleston Animal Society has successfully managed that crisis thus far and and the process has become an international model of life-saving success. Um, the theme tonight is kind of veterinarians and celebration, celebrating our increasing capacity with veterinarians in our state. Your Charleston Animal Society veterinarians have trained veterinarians from across the country and overseas as far away as veterinarians from Nepal and Tanzania coming to Charleston Animal Society for training. But all of this is not sustainable. A nonprofit serving as the government's vendor for stray and other animals cannot continue to pay the overwhelming cost of government's obligations, especially when government does not invest in prevention. We would not expect a nonprofit to pay for an entire police department or law enforcement agency, nor would we expect law enforcement to try to build countless jails to solve crime without investing in preventing people from committing crimes and overwhelming the criminal justice system. Government's inaction is the biggest threat facing animals and their families in our community today, government's inaction. By significantly pulling back on our prevention efforts, primarily spay and neuter, in order to save the increasing number of animals in our community because government won't pay its financial obligations, our community, both humans and animals, suffers with a growing increase in stray animals roaming neighborhoods, a growing increase, this reversed 10-year trend. We must demand government stop playing games, kicking the can down the road, and pay its financial obligations for its animals. The combined operating budgets of our government, our seats of government in Charleston County, the combined, approach $1 billion to adequately fund an animal sheltering system for the animals in our county is less than a half of 1% of those combined budgets. I wish they'd let me find the money. I could find it fast. Um, although it should address this public health and safety issue with both prevention and response, we say to government, pay your full obligation for response. That is sheltering. We'll handle prevention, the spay and neuter. Government, follow our lead. We have proven what works. The last thing anyone wants is for government to go back a century and summarily execute stray animals in the most horrific ways, such as drowning in the Cooper River. But that has actually been bandied about. We notified all governments in past years that this crisis was coming, with minimal, if any, response or engagement. However, we will continue to nudge and pressure our local governments of the city of Charleston, the city of North Charleston, and Charleston County to follow the leadership of the town of Mount Pleasant, which deserves kudos for engaging us and recognizing its responsibility on this public health and safety issue by paying its full cost for its animals coming to the animal shelter and also investing in community spay and neuter as the most effective response to the animal overpopulation. And I believe we have a couple of folks from Mount Pleasant. Um, the lights are kind of blinding me, but I know, Carl, you are very hard to miss. Um, Councilman Carl Ritchie, will you stand? And Eric DeMora, town administrator. <laughs> Eric, Eric is back there. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Carl for your forward-looking and your responsiveness to your constituencies, um, real leadership, and I'm proud that you're here. Again, a big shout out to Mount Pleasant. But as I said, we'll continue to work with local governments, but we need your help. There are elections this year. And although as a nonprofit, we may not endorse candidates, we can certainly publicize their stands on issues and make it clear what they are doing about their obligations as current or potential elected officials. We have a social media of over a quarter of a million. 
an email database of 60,000. We have 20,000 members this year. Heed our call when we make it. Watch carefully and thoroughly because you are a force, a true silent majority that hasn't been awakened. Again, despite these challenges facing us and the Animal Society statewide initiative, No Kill South Carolina 2024, this statewide project continues to blaze a leading path across the South in its life-saving efforts. South Carolina simply does not have to be at or near the bottom in everything. Just take a look again because it's worth repeating at what Charleston Animal Society, your animal society, accomplished last year, 12 consecutive years of exemplary audits completed by independent auditing firms, 12 consecutive years as South Carolina's top-rated nonprofit, of which there are over 30,000 active in South Carolina, 11 years of building and sustaining the Southeast's first no-kill county, the 2023 North American winner as top nonprofit honoree in the Land Rover Defender Service Awards, a Guinness World Record for vaccinations, six consecutive years of a national record for largest statewide adoption event, earning and sustaining the first American Animal Hospital Association accredited combined animal shelter and animal hospital in the South. And although not the largest animal shelter by size of its facilities, rather the largest life-saving animal shelter in South Carolina with the number of animals, over 9,000 that we took in last year and the number saved. And we continue to move forward with our plans to expand the campus and capacity of your animal society to lead our community and state in effectively addressing these crises. So why do I warn of the consequences of this beast of a storm we are in? yet tout the unprecedented accomplishments at the same time and how your animal society is weathering that storm. It's because to survive it, all hands must be on deck this year. As the storm is sinking many ships across our state and country, and what I mean by sinking ships is putting down animals that can easily be saved. This ship is full steam ahead because of each and every one of you You've got to answer the call when it's made, and we'll make that this year. For us to move our community successfully forward, continuing to save the animals who should be saved and reducing the growing overpopulation, making our communities safer and healthier so that we can raise our families. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, a safe and healthy community to raise our families. I warned you, I touted you, most of all, I. Thank you. 2024, this is No Kill South Carolina, 2024. This is the time to make a stand for our animals, our families, our homes, our community, and our state of South Carolina. We competed across our nation and we won. Last year, we competed, competed across an entire continent of North America and won. We competed against the world and won. You are Charleston Animal Society. No fear, no surrender. We are a force. Thank you. Twenty twenty three was a banner year for No Kill South Carolina. Thank you, South Carolina. You opened your hearts and your homes for Pick Me SC, No Kill South Carolina's statewide adoption event. This year we set our sights higher than ever before and we aim to send two thousand dogs and cats into homes. Well we crushed it. We sent two thousand and thirty dogs and cats into loving new homes during this event. Congratulations on a world record. Congratulations, Congratulations on, on the, the world, world record. record. Woo! Pet the Love wants to raise that excitement level up throughout all of South Carolina with a challenge grant. If the organizations in South Carolina work together and achieve No Kill South Carolina by 2024, Petco Love will invest 
one million dollars collectively to organizations throughout South Carolina for their life-saving work. And these funds can be used to sustain No-Kill South Carolina forever. Please welcome. Please welcome Charleston Animal Society Board Vice Chair Jerry Greenwood. Joe, if I could see you. <laughs> thank you for those inspiring remarks, but more importantly, thank you for your leadership. It's definitely what we need with the next 150 years we're going forward with with Charleston Animal Society. We'd like to thank everybody here in the room for attending live, and those of you on Facebook. It means so much for us to be able to tell you our story and have you be there to support us. As Patricia said earlier, you, 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 and you are Charleston Animal Society. Now, before we wrap up, something a little fun. I know that just about everybody in the room and online owns the most precious dog or cat ever in the world, right? I know I do. <laughs> so now's your chance to share your pet or pets with the world. The 2024 Rescue Brew Contest has just opened and one cat and one dog will be the face of the 2024 Rescue Brew this year sponsored by Commonwealth Ale House in North Charleston. So it's very easy to sign your animal up, just take out your phone, and then type in charlestonanimalsociety.org rescue brew. So I think we should all give an applause for the future cat and dog. And at this point, this is the end of our program. Sorry to say, it's been great, but I think you're all probably a little hungry and thirsty. Please join us outside for the reception. Once again, we couldn't do any of this without you. It touches our hearts. Good night. <laughs>